Okay, so now we're going to go back into talk mode, and I am personally very, yeah, very much looking forward to and very excited about this uh, talk. I'm going to tell a little anecdote. I'm going to tell a lot of anecdotes about people who are part of the gay community as uh, part of the moderation for today. So uh, many years back, and I'm sorry that I don't know the exact year, but I believe it was around 2.15, maybe it was even a year earlier, about 2.14. Um, we were really excited, the gay community, when they learned that Andrew Lamb was coming to Republica to give a talk. Talk, and everybody was really like, oh my goodness, it's going to be like Andrew Lamb, we're going to actually meet him in person, this is so exciting. And there was a lot of, yeah, <laughs> a lot of people really starstruck about uh, meeting Andrew, and that's why one of the many, many reasons we're so happy and honored and proud that he's now a core cool member of this community and we're doing fantastic work together in different projects, including the Make Project, uh, which is one of the Horizon projects that we're currently running. So Andrew is the co-founder of the Internet of Production Alliance, and was formerly also the global innovation lead at Field Ready. He was the CEO and co-founder of Engineers Without Borders UK. He's a Shuttleworth fellow focusing on open approaches in massive small manufacturing. And today he's going to take a brief look into yeah, the complexity of the global innovation gathering, the lessons that we've learned along the way, and highlight some of the cool things we've done together, and maybe a bit of Lego. So let's have a please, a born round, big round of applause for Andrew, Gig versus the World. Hello. Hello. My talk is really about gig. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about gig. So yeah, my name's Andrew. I am a recovering workaholic. And <laughs> hello. <laughs> Other people identify in this room. Um, and really, uh, what I want to talk a little bit about, how much time do I have? 15 minutes, thank you. What I really want to talk about is this idea of gig versus the world, and the way the world is, which isn't necessarily the way it should be, and the way that gig is, uh, which I think is exactly the way it should be. Um, but I want to start by, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm British, I'm, I'm not used to talking about personal things, emotions and things, um, but I want to tell you a little bit of a personal story which was about uh, the worst uh, workaholic burnout experience of my life, um, which uh, was when I was four years into being the chief exec of Engineers Without Borders in the UK. And um, I, you know, I started volunteering with Engineers Without Borders. It was a student club at university. That's all it was. And then we registered as a charity, and then it became this big thing. You know, went all over the uh, country, all over the world. Um, and, uh, you know, I started it, I started, I joined it as uh, an undergraduate. I didn't know anything. I was studying engineering, couldn't really figure out why. It was all maths all the time. I had no reason to, d to do this. And I got involved in Engineers Without Borders, and it gave me a reason because they would try to solve problems in the world, prob often problems in other countries. Uh, that was what Engineers Without Borders was about. Um, and the, um, you know, we, set, we registered the charity, we set up a board of trustees, we, a bit like the journey Gig's been through, we set up all of these systems, we started winning projects and bringing money in. So I learned about um, governance and hierarchy and accountancy and accounting and project management and um, planning and budgeting and cash flow and um, logical framework analysis and theory of change and all of these tools that we use to run organizations. Um, and at the same time, Engineers Without Borders was growing. Um, and it moved from like one student club to another university, another university, another university. Um, we ended up in about 35, 40 universities across the UK. My job was basically twice a year, I would go to 40 cities, traveling around the country, giving talks uh, to, in, to try and lead help people lead the movement. And then people could come up to me and say, well, what can I do? I want to be part of Engineers Without Borders. And I would say, well, what do you want to do? And they said, I'd really like to do this. And I was like, well, yeah, do that. 
Um, but it was very much about a, um, a movement. And we started, we did some really audacious things. We were sending uh, young, inexperienced engineers to developing countries, to places all over the world um, to be catalysts for change in host organizations where they would bring some expertise around solar energy or around rainwater harvesting or around road building. And they would be there and, you know, they were not qualified engineers. They were not, they were young. They had beginner's minds, but they were catalysts. They had no authority in those organizations. They had no authority in those communities, in those countries to do this, but they were there as catalysts. We started working on engin engineering education curriculum reform. So what we started to do was change university degrees, because what I thought we were learning and what many other engineers, young engineers, thought they were learning at university wasn't helpful. And a lot of companies said the same thing. Because we were learning steel and silicon and carbon and combustion. We were learning a diet of toxic substances the kind of technologies that have killed the planet. And we were being taught the same thing. It was madness. So we started working with about 30 different universities, and we changed the curriculum in 30 different universities to include global issues and sustainability and climate change as a required part of the curriculum. And it was amazing. We were a movement for change. It was really, really good. I was exhausted. I was burned out. I was exhilarated by the movement, and I was burned out by trying to run the organization. And the reason was because I was in EWB versus the world, Engineers Without Borders versus the world. We, were, we had to be hierarchical, accountable. We had to pass audits. We had to plan our budgets. We had to manage cash flow. We had to do staff appraisals. We had to do log frames. We had to do all of this work. But we were really a movement. We had a split identity. And I was in the middle, trying to run this thing. And I burned out, because the way the world really is, and the way I'd been taught it should be, with hierarchy and management and boards and quarterly planning meetings and things like that, it was bullshit. You know, all of this stuff about how you run an organization is not the way the world works. And after a while, after about four years of this, I decided the time had come, well, five years, um, I left and because I was burnt out and I couldn't cope anymore. And it's the same experience a number of other people have in this world of activism, of change, that, you know, and, and the reason why GIG is so important to me is it's an interface between the linear structures of working with donors like GIZ, um, or the British government, or you know, big foundations, or even, God help us, corporate CSR programs. You know, I was working with co with companies who said we'd love to give you a check, but you know, to do that you need to get our staff involved. I had two and a half thousand volunteers <laughs> working every day in engineers without borders. The last thing we needed was more volunteers. I mean, it's great, yeah, get more people in, involved, build the movement or whatever, but don't make it a quid pro quo. Give us the money because you like it. Companies, come on. <laughs> like. One of my favorite movies is the Lego movie, <laughs> which, as you know, is probably one of the greatest philosophical works of our times. And it has a character, a black box, Referring back to the previous conversation about repair, it's a black box. It has a character called the micromanager. <laughs> and these micromanagers roam around the little Lego planet, making sure that people follow the instructions, which is what I had been taught to do and how to run an organization. Right? So you've got the micromanager. Lovely little thing. I actually think it's a rather beautiful object. I keep it on my desk whenever I get contracts from the European Commission. <laughs> I look at it and think, we're in another fight. And then, I'm not trying to topple the regime. There is, no, there is no symbolism here. And then, the other thing I have on my desk is the real world. 
Captain Metalbeard. And Captain Metalbeard is a creative amalgamation of all sorts of different things. He's obviously got a laser shooting shark, very important. I would say maybe that's like the critical making project. Um, we have a leg that's made out of a, um, uh, an anchor for a ship. We have, um, well, you know, all sorts of moving parts. There's a parrot, obviously, because he's a pirate. And because I have, because it's Lego, it's designed for repair. So I'm going to repair it on, live on stage. And these two characters came, have come to represent my life. I win grants from bureaucracies and have to fight, fight to manage the cash flow. And then there's the real world about the amorphous amalgam, the changes we have to make, which are nonlinear, which are creative, which are da dynamic, which are orientated around people and not processes. So in 2015, 2016, whenever, 14, whenever it was, I got to know GIG, the Global Innovation Gathering. And um, I was at a point where we were building a, small, a new small organization called Field Ready. And it was as simple as this. We won a grant, we did the grant, we had no money. We went back to being volunteers. We got another grant, we did the grant, we got no money. And we couldn't really respond to the world. And so what happened was I started meeting people through gig. And then suddenly, I happened to know people in the Philippines. And I happened to know people in Iraq. And I happened to know people in all these different countries around the world, in Kenya. And I got to know them. I got to know them personally. And I got to trust them. And I was able to, rather than having one little project at a time, I was able to build something um, which ended up being quite a, a big organization, Field Ready, uh, 100 people. And then out of that, create systems change pro projects like the Internet of Production. Because I'd met people at GIG and because we were able to have that sort of trusting relationship. And because GIG is the interface between these worlds, it, it is able to cope. The organization is able to cope with you know, the GIZ contracts and the, um, the European Commission contracts. But we also, and this is the bit it really fosters, we have the community going. In between me stepping down as the chief executive of Engineers Without Borders and uh, starting with Field Ready and the success that GIG enabled it to have, um, I did some learning. I tried to reflect why was I burnt out. <laughs> And I got very interested in complexity, complexity theory and chaos theory and things like that. There's a, a framework called the Kenevin framework. And it's, um, it's a Welsh word that means um, habitat. Uh, the Kenevin framework, and it basically has four quadrants, simple, complicated, chaotic, and complex. And you know, order uh, increases as you go up. So as you go from a, you know, simple to um, as you have more variables, it goes from simple to complicated. And this is the world of manufacturing. This is the world of organizations and planning. And as you have levels of disorder, you go from simple to chaotic. You go from complicated to complex. And this is the real world. This is the real world. Now, um, there is also a complexity. So, so I, I now use that tool. I now speak to these characters on my desk trying to work out who I'm fighting today, <laughs> who I'm with today, who I'm, which side am I on today. But I now think about the Kenevin framework to work out which quadrant am I in today. Is this a simple thing or is this a really complex, nonlinear thing? Uh, there is another um, theory uh, called the viable systems model. And this has been around since the 60s. And it was developed by a cyberneticist. And the viable systems model theory is basically about, uh, it's a theory of, that a complex organization is more capable of responding to a changing or an unpredictable environment if it is composed of autonomous, effective, and agile, like sub-organizations, if it's highly connected to each other, and if it's cohesively operating with a shared ethos, purpose, process, and technologies. My organization, Field Ready, was really small. It was fighting the world of bureaucracy. It couldn't really grow. Then we met GIG, and GIG, 
gave us this enabling environment that enhanced our ability, something that we heard this morning um, from Ricardo, and a shared ethos to grow. And because of that, I, have, I feel I'm now able to respond more capably to a changing and unpredictable environment. The particular piece of the viable systems model that GIG, the, the, the function that it performs as an organization and as a community, is between if you have the sort of the organization and if you have the system you're, you're interacting with, the system you're trying to change, you need links between them. And that's called cohesion. You know, in a, a company it would be you have the company and you have the market. And if, you, if they don't match, your company fails. You know, if the market changes, your company has to keep up. It's called cohesion between them. And you need a lot of money. You need a lot of money. You need to be a big organization to be able to afford cohesion. I was in a small organization with Field Ready. I was in a small organization with Engineers Without Borders. We didn't have, we couldn't make that cohesion with the rest of the world. Gig provided us that cohesion with the rest of the world. And as a result, I'm pretty sure that I can look back at what we've been able to do over the last few years and say we've been able to change the world together. Thank you.